All right, we are going to turn in our Bibles today to Micah chapter number 6, verse 8. I told you last week that this would be my final sermon on this subject. It's not. I didn't lie to you. I told you the truth at the time, but the Lord changed my plans because I could not get away from how I left this last week. And I thought there's more to this. And as I sought the Lord, I did uh, begin to feel some things. And I want to talk about those things today. The Bible says in Micah chapter six, verse eight, this is the verse we've been using for the last three weeks. This will be the fourth week. He has shown you, O man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you? The Lord does require things of us. And this is one of several of them, some of them. Number one, to do justly. Number two, to love mercy. And number three, and this is the one I've highlighted and been focusing on, and that is to walk humbly with your God. Walking with God. That's the title of this sermon. Turns out to be a series. This is part number four. And I want to subtitle this one, The Power of Your Failure. The Power of Your Failure. Let's pray together. Jesus, we love you and we thank you for your blessings and your goodness. And we ask that you will touch and bless in this house today. That you will minister to the needs of your people. But not only that, Lord, you'll speak to me and through me and use me to deliver a message today that I feel you want us to hear, to understand how it is that you work with us and what you will do through us and with us. I pray in Jesus' name. Everyone said amen. You can be seated. Let's all clap our hands one more time for Jesus, shall we, today? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. I think last week I ended um, that message by informing us that we do not have to be perfect to serve God. And to live for God. And oftentimes we're striving for perfection and we never quite attain it. And when we don't attain it, we get discouraged and feel like we're worthless and a failure. And I pointed out that there were great men. And I used three examples of Enoch. Um, I used Abraham and I used Moses. And the truth of the matter is, last week I, I brought out that you can please God like Enoch. You can believe God like Abraham and you can obey God like Moses and yet still not be perfect like all three of them were not perfect. All three of them were not perfect. So I encouraged us last week to not let our shortcomings and our failures and our weaknesses rob us of our relationship with God. And I really want to wrap that up today by explaining us uh, something that I feel is very under, uh, very important um, that we understand and uh, about all that we've talked about so far, because obviously Enoch pleased God, and that's all the Bible really says about him, Enoch pleased God. Um, And yet we know that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, so Enoch must not have always pleased God. (laughs) Otherwise, he disproves the scripture that says all have sinned. And we know that Abraham believed God, but we know he didn't always believe God because he failed in his faith where Ishmael was concerned and where lying to Pharaoh was concerned and lying to Abimelech was concerned. And we know Moses obeyed God, but he didn't always obey God because he smashed the tables of stone and struck the rock rather than speak to it and wouldn't go before Pharaoh unless Aaron went with him. So we know all these men did these great things, but we talked last week about how they also were failures in many areas and, uh, and yet still went down in history as being great. And I want you to understand today that with your failures, with your shortcomings, with your mistakes, and with your sins, you can still be great in the eyes of God. And I want to explain how that works today because I want to talk to us today about the power of our failure, the power of our failure. If we can look at failure correctly, we can use it as stepping stones and building blocks rather than tearing down and destroying us. On the surface, there are some mistakes that realistically seem like the end of the world. Oh, no, I can't believe I did that, or I can't believe this has happened, or I'm done, or I'm doomed, or there's, it's, all, it's hopeless. But on the, on the, uh, so uh, sometimes mistakes do look like that. But the truth of the matter is every one of our errors and our mistakes, and I want to explain to you when I say mistake, because sometimes a mistake is a word in our day that connotes something that that was just a mistake. You know, sometimes we 
actually sin. Wow, that was just a mistake. Can we downplay the word mistake? Uh, but I want you to know what the word mistake really is because I'm going to use that word today not as a downplaying of error or downplaying of sin, but the literal dis, um, definition of mistake is an action or a judgment that is misguided or wrong. That's what a mistake is. It's an action, a judgment, or in that case, a thought that is misguided or it is wrong. In other words, an action you took was wrong. We call it sin, don't we? Uh, a failure. We call it failure. Those are actions that were misguided. And it's where they're misguided from that we need to take a look at and we need to talk about a little bit today because I believe we're going to discover that both or all three of, we don't know about Enoch because the Bible doesn't tell us anything more about him except that he pleased God. But we do know about Abraham. We do know about Moses. And we are going to see that these men did fail, but that they use their misguided judgments and wrongdoings to enable them to do better the next time. All right? So mistakes are actually valuable. We condemn ourselves. We beat ourselves up. We just get discouraged. And when in actuality, mistakes are valuable, but in order for them to be of value, we need to see them as valuable rather than to let the devil beat us over the head or ourselves beat us over the head for our wrongdoings. We need to learn from them and we need to take a look at what happened, what brought us to this place and what misguided us. What is it that caused us to become misguided or a judgment that was wrong? And so it's always a tendency to dwell upon our mistakes. That's our tendency in our human nature is to dwell upon our mistakes, to tear ourselves down, to uh, regret, to loathe the actions we've taken, the attitudes we have, the personalities we have, the directions we take, and we instinctively respond to our mistakes in a negative manner. And I think it would behoove us all to begin to take a positive look at our wrongdoings. Because you can do that. You, you, there is a place for repentance, but after repentance, there needs to be a positive outlook on what went wrong and how we ended up doing what we ended up doing. Because our mistakes and our errors and our sins, um, they defeat us so much more when we feel hopeless about it. We are defeated when we feel there's no hope. And we can oftentimes feel there's no hope if we keep falling in the same area. But if we keep falling in the same area, how many times does a child fall before he can walk and not fall? How many times? How many times before the child decides, I'm not going to walk, I'll never be able to walk, I'm done with this? How many people have walked away from God because they had tried and failed and oftentimes failed in the same area? How many times should you get up and try it again? I'm going to tell you how many times you should get up and try it again. Once more. <laughs> Once more. That's your, that's your catchphrase. Once more. But you've done it a hundred times. I'm going to try it once more. Well, it's, it's 150 times now you fail. I'm going to try it once more. Well, now it's 200 times you failed. Yeah, but I'm going to try it once more. Can you say amen? So we got to keep looking at what went wrong and improving because our errors and our sins are either going to defeat us so that we stop trying or they're going to help us because we're going to grow from them and we have that choice to make. That's the choice we have to make. And so dwelling upon mistakes, negatively dwelling upon mistakes, diminishes our self-worth. Now, I could preach a whole message on your self-worth. I want you to know you are worth enough for Jesus to go to Calvary for. I don't know what you think of you, but I know what Jesus thinks of you. Amen? I'm not sure what you think of you, but I do know what God thinks of you. And when we make mistakes, our tendency is to dwell upon them, to regret them, to loathe them, and then in turn begin to loathe ourselves. And so we're either going to be defeated by them so that we stop trying, 
But uh, dwelling on all of our errors and all of our shortcomings in a negative way only cause us to become confident in the fact that we can't do this. How many people have walked away from God because they think, I just can't live like that? I just can't do it. How many people have walked away from God because they, not because they don't love God, but because they don't love their walk with God and they think they cannot live up to God's standards? Amen? And I've used this a lot, and I'm just going to throw this out here today. How many mothers, expectant mothers, are looking forward to a healthy, lovely child coming forth, fulfilling all of their dreams and wishes and anticipation? But what kind of a mother would reject a child if it was born with a physical or mental defect? Huh? And what kind of a God would reject you because you can't live up to the standard that someone else lives at? I'm saying we need to stop comparing ourselves to what others are doing and allow God to work in us to become the person he wants us to become. Amen? And so dwelling on mistakes trigger the, um, the, uh, the tendency to put things off, stop trying as hard, stop working as hard at it, stop praying as much, along with a plethora of emotions that come in, such as anger and disappointment, discouragement, hopelessness, fear, doubt. None of those are good. None of those emotions are good. And yet that's what we riddle ourselves with when we focus on our failures with a wrong attitude. I'm not saying don't focus on your failure. I'm saying focus on your failure with a right attitude. Learn from it. Learn from your failures. So we need to become comfortable. And I, I, I have to be very, I have to, I have to tiptoe around this lest I, lest I give the wrong impression. But we need to become comfort, comfortable with our errors. Now, I do not mean we need to accept our errors and condone our errors. When I say be comfortable with them. I'm saying be comfortable with them in the sense that you are going to make them. And I don't care how long you've lived for God. I don't care how successful you've been for how many years you've been. You are still going to blunder and fall along the way. And you need to become comfortable with the fact that the, from this day forward, you will not be perfect. But when you do stumble and don't pre-plan... <laughs> But when you do falter, you need to look at it positively, find out why, what went wrong, what was I thinking, where was I, was I in the wrong place, was I thinking wrong things, did I allow this too long, did I allow that, what brought me to that place, so that I can learn from that and not come to that place again in the future. Can you say amen? Now listen to what the Bible says in Haggai chapter 1 verse 7. We oftentimes forget that the Bible tells us to do these very things. And I'm using the amplified version in this scripture just to give us clarity of understanding what the Bible is saying. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Haggai 1 verse 7, Consider your ways. You ready for this? And thoughtfully reflect on your conduct. That's what the prophet wrote from the word of God to tell us to do, to consider our ways and to thoughtfully reflect. What is the reflect? Think back. There I fell again. All right, what brought me to that place? What am I thinking? What am I doing? What did I not do? What could I have done better? Where should I have done? How should I think? Think. Because one of these days, you're going to put enough pieces of this puzzle together that you're going to conquer it. But the devil wants you to stop trying before you get to that place of conquering. Somebody ought to clap your hands for that. <clears throat> now the problem is, 
sometimes we're just too ashamed to really think about <laughs> what it is we've done. Sometimes it's just too convicting, too shameful to really think about what we thought, what brought us to that place, and what we did. But how many of us want to be a better Christian? Hopefully all of us. I want to be better. Well, the very fact that we want to be better indicates the fact that we're not there yet. If I want to be a better Christian, I have to first admit that I'm not a perfect Christian. In order for me to be better, I have to take a look at myself and say, I'm not good enough yet. Everybody wants to be a better Christian, don't they? And so we need to be able to look and say, the reason I want to be better is because I'm not where I want to be yet. And that's why we're here today, actually. Why did you come to church today? Well, of course we want to honor God. Of course we want to praise God. Of course we want to give glory to God. But we also want to grow. We're also desirous to be closer to Him. I would dare say for every single one of us, it would have been easier to sleep in today. It would have been easier to take a day off. Some of us might even have to work on Sundays. and Come to 8.30 so that you can be to work on time, and it's an extra sacrifice. Uh, why do we do those things? Because we want to be better Christians today than we were yesterday. That's why we do it. Praise God. But the path to that goal is naturally, because of our nature, riddled with mistakes, riddled with errors of judgment, riddled with unforeseen circumstances that cause us to stumble and fall, and riddled with miscalculated decisions that cause us to do the wrong thing. And that's just a natural part of life. I don't care if it's trying to live for God or trying to be anything. All of these things apply. You could take this as a self-help message. Preach it in a company somewhere. You want to be a better boss? Learn from your mistakes. huh? You want to be a better Christian? Don't let your failures defeat you. Learn to use your failures as a source of energy to do better the next time by focusing on them for a positive reason. If we understand this process, we can become better because mistakes enhance us rather than defeat us. Huh? Uh, you, you know the story of Thomas Edison. What did he try a thousand times? They say to make it the light bulb, and they, after 900 times, they said, have you give up? You, you failed 900 times. He goes, no, I haven't. I just found 900 ways that didn't work yet. <laughs> the way that works is still out there. I just haven't discovered it yet. You failed. You've been failing every day of your life. But no, I haven't. I just found, th I'm just, I've learned from every one of those failures to try it this way today. Well, that failed too. Well, then I'll try it another way tomorrow, but I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to learn from my mistakes of the past and press on. Can you say amen? And if we understand this process, we can become better because of our failures rather than defeated because of our failures. Can someone say amen? It's important to remember, very important to remember, because this is the devil's job. The devil is the accuser of the brethren, you know. The devil is the accuser of the brethren. The devil is the one that comes around and says, ah, oh, see, you failed again. You're hopeless. The devil is the one that comes around and says, why don't you quit going to church? You're never going to live like the rest of them live. Little do you know you already are. <laughs> you just don't know what the rest of them's problems are. <laughs> they may not even be your problems, but they've got problems too. Anybody perfect here today want to stand up and shout hallelujah? <laughs> you see, the devil is the accuser of the brethren. What does the devil do? Focuses on your failure with the goal of defeating you and getting you to stop trying it again. That's his goal. 
You're a failure, you're no good, and that's how quickly we in our minds go to that area when we fail. You're hopeless, you're no good. What if we looked at the failure every time we failed and turned around and said, what brought me to that place leading up to it? How did I end up at that place of temptation that I could not resist it? And what can I do differently the next time? And the next time I find myself doing that, stop for a second and say, wait a second now, the last time this led me there. And even if it's a desire in our heart, why do I have this desire in my heart? Is there something in my life that's missing? Has something happened? Let me take this to the Lord and see if he can fix this thing that's wrong in my heart. I'm reminded over and over and over and over again of my dear friend, Brother Stephen Beatty, who preached from this pulpit one day and told us how when he came to God, it was a, it's a story that can be life transforming if you'll allow it to be. He said, I came to God and I had this sinful nature in my flesh that I could not overcome. And for a year, now for him it was a year, for you, it could be two years, three years, four years. Don't you ever stop trying. Don't you ever let the devil tell you it's not worth it. Because it might be the last time before you breathe your last breath that you get the victory over it. And you're on your way to glory. He said for a year, I would go to the altar and pray and repent and ask God to help me and go out before the next service next Sunday, I had failed again. And I came back to church and I brought it before God and repented and asked God to help me and went out and failed again. He said, this went on for a year until finally I brought it to the altar one more time and God helped me. And I'm going to be honest with you. I think if he put some meat on that story, he would tell you that he worked in his brain, worked in his mind with the help of the Holy Ghost to figure out what's happening in his heart and his emotions or his world around him that causes him to fail like that. And what can he do to conquer that? And eventually he did. It's important for us to remember something. You are not your mistakes. You are not your sins. Did you hear me? It's not who you are. Mistakes and sin may be what you do when you fail, but that does not mean that's who you are. You want to know who you are? I'm going to tell you who you are. And I'm going to go to I'm going to tell you by quoting what is forever settled in heaven. This is what the Bible says you are. A child of God. A royal priesthood, a holy people, a chosen generation. And there is not a man or a woman alive who is, or who has ever been alive that has not made a mistake and has not committed a sin and has not done what is considered sin in the eyes of God. There's not a man alive or a woman alive or who has ever lived, including Enoch, Abraham, and Moses. Not to mention the Apostle Peter, the Apostle Paul, and the other Apostles. Not to mention them. I want to wrap this up by telling you one final story here, but let me just say that nobody has ever achieved anything worthwhile. No one has ever successfully lived for God. No one has ever worked. No one has ever been a great preacher, a great apostle, a great minister without failing greatly along the way and picking up the pieces, learning from the mistake, and doing it better, not perfectly necessarily, but better the next time. Can you say amen? I'm not justifying sin. I'm not trying to justify you going out and living how you want. Don't, please don't take this wrong. I am telling you, you, when you fall, learn from it so you can do better the next time. Not give into it 
so that you are that person from now on. The Bible tells us, and I'm going to close with this, a story about Abraham, who we know failed at least on three occasions. Probably if I studied the life of Abraham, I'd find even more so. But at least on three occasions, just off the top of my head, he failed by bringing forth Ishmael instead of waiting for Isaac like he should have. He failed in lying to Pharaoh when he should have just told Pharaoh, this is my wife. And then even after that worked out, when he knew he should have told the truth, he lied again to Abimelech. The same thing. Fell in the same area. <laughs> how many of you think we shouldn't, how many get discouraged when we keep falling in the same area? He did the same thing. Lied again. This is my, this is my sister. Abraham failed. Now in chapter 22 of Genesis, this is what the Bible says God did with Abraham. This is after his failures, by the way. This is after he already struggled and stumbled and fell and did things wrong. God is still talking to him. God is still working with him. And God says this in verse 2 of chapter 22 of Genesis, Take now your son, your only son. And what he meant by that was this was the promised son. Because we know Ishmael was his son. But your only son through whom the promise is coming. Take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on the mountains of which I shall tell you. Chances are... <clears throat> I would not have responded the way Abraham responded. And chances are every one of us would totally understand if Abraham not only did not go to Moriah, the mountain of Moriah, what was the mountain's name? Take now the mountain, it was Mount Moriah, land of Moriah. Chances are we would head in the opposite direction. Because God's asking me something, I can't, I, I, I can't do that. God is going to ask you sooner or later, if he hasn't already, to do something you don't believe you can do. But how are you going to be able to do it? You're going to look back at when you failed and what you learned from those failures so that you can look forward and say, I can trust God to get me through this. That's where you'll eventually come. If you learn from your mistakes, use your mistakes as a power force behind you to teach you rather than to defeat you. Listen to what the Bible says. The Bible tells us in Genesis, uh, I'm sorry, Galatians in the New Testament, looking back on it, it says that Abraham believed God in this situation, and it was accounted unto him as righteousness. There was no hesitation in Abraham when God said, take Isaac to the mountain in Moriah and offer him there as a sacrifice to me. You and I may not totally understand what the sacrifice is, but Abraham fully understood that a sacrifice meant put him to death. Fully understood it. And yet, the man who couldn't tell the truth to Pharaoh the man who couldn't wait for the promises of God to be fulfilled in God's time had no problem whatsoever grabbing Isaac and saying come on we're going to go off to the mountain over here where are we going you'll see when we get there <laughs> if I tell you you won't come because what I'm going to do is when I get you there, I'm going to put you to death. No hesitation. How did he arrive at this place of no hesitation? He learned from the error of his ways. He learned that God can bring him through any circumstance. He learned by dealing with Pharaoh that he didn't have to lie. God could have delivered him. And when he didn't have it down straight yet and lied again to Abimelech about the same thing, he learned there, wait a second, see that? God brought me through that too. Why did I feel like God couldn't do it? And he analyzed and figured it out. God said he would do it. God did it. He understood these things. 
He looked at Ishmael and he said, man, I can't believe, I, I, I didn't think God was going to bring to pass what he said he was going to bring to pass. And, and so I took it into my own hands and now here's Ishmael. But look at God did bring forth the son that he promised. Years later, with a woman who was beyond childbirth, God did do it. And he began to understand by looking at the errors in his past, he understood that God is able to do whatever he said. Now, what did God say about Isaac? Here's what God said about Isaac. Through Isaac, the seed of your seed will come like the stars of the heavens and like the sand of the sea. It's going to come through Isaac. But God, you're asking me to kill him. How are these, How is he ever going to produce seed like the sand of the sea or the stars of the heavens if he's dead? By faith. Hebrews eleven seventeen 17 says about Abraham. When he was tested. Tested. God was testing his faith to see if it had improved from the days of his failures. Offered up Isaac, whom he had received the promise, offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, in Isaac your seed shall be called. Ready for verse 19? Look it up if you want to. Hebrews chapter 11, this is verse 19. Abraham concluded. Where, how can he come to this conclusion that I'm about to read to you? I'll tell you how he came to this conclusion. He dealt with Pharaoh and out of fear and lack of faith lied to him and found out later God could have handled that and did handle it. He went to Abimelech and still failed in the same area again and lied again and found out God could handle it and did handle it. He brought forth Ishmael because he didn't believe that, uh, that Sarah could actually have a child and that this was getting too far away from our ability to accomplish something. So he took matters into his own hands and found out years later God could do what God said he was going to do. So he looked back at his past examples of failure and learned that God can do what I can't figure out. Verse number 19 says, Abraham concluded, offer up your son Isaac on this altar. He concluded that God was able to raise him up even from the dead. From which he also received him in a figurative sense. Listen to me. If God says the seed is coming, I have my failure has brought me to the place where I can trust whatever God says, no matter how far fetched it seems. What brought him to that? Failure brought him to that place. The power of his failure, he used it to be successful in casting the type and shadow of God giving up his only begotten son. Kill your boy. And he said, I will kill him. Because I believe you said through him my seed is going to come, so you're able to raise him from the dead if so be, but I'm trusting God. Where did Abraham find that kind of faith? By looking back on times he failed and learning from it. His faith was being perfected in those times, and it was in his failure and his mistakes and his inability to trust God that he actually learned how to trust God. So I close by saying this, don't let the devil defeat you because you have failed or you do fail God. Use those failures, use those sins, use those errors to increase your faith the next time, to correct your way when you face your hardships in the future. And don't forget Abraham failed more than once. At the same thing. So don't you ever give up. You need to press on, get up, learn what you can, try it again. You only lose when you quit trying. Amen? Let's stand together. We need to understand the power of our failure to spur us on to the power of our victory.